in this decision. Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on EU negotiations and Scotland's future. I would urge members, if they wish to ask a question, to press their request to speak button now. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions until then. And I call on the First Minister. Presiding officer, like other countries, Scotland faces big challenges. Some of those challenges, like, like Brexit, are not of our choosing. But we must always remember that Scotland is one of the richest countries in the world, with resources and talent in abundance. Our task is to make the most of our great potential and build the kind of country we want to be, a fair, prosperous, open and tolerant country. And working towards that goal, my responsibility as First Minister is to build as much unity and consensus as possible. And that is why, after the election, which was, of course, won by the SNP in Scotland, I said that I would reflect on the outcome and in particular on the issue of an independence referendum. I have done so carefully, taking time to listen to a broad spectrum of voices both within and out with my party. I want to set out today where those reflections have taken me. Before I do so, though, let me underline two enduring points. Firstly, it remains my view and indeed the position of this government that at the end of the Brexit process, the people of Scotland should have a choice about our future direction as a country. Indeed, the implications of Brexit are so potentially far-reaching that as they become clearer, I think people will increasingly demand that choice. We face a Brexit that we did not vote for and in a form more extreme than most would have imagined just one year ago. And now the terms of that Brexit are being negotiated by a UK government with no clear mandate, precious little authority and no real idea, even within its own ranks, of what it is seeking to achieve. While we must hope for the best, the reality is that with the UK government's current approach, even a so-called good deal will be on terms substantially inferior to our current EU membership. And of course, there is now a real risk that the UK will crash out of the EU with no deal or a very bad deal, with deep and long-lasting consequences for jobs, trade, investment, living standards and the opportunities open to future generations. On top of all of that, as we saw so clearly in the deal struck with the DUP yesterday, we now have a UK government that talks about wanting to strengthen the bonds of the UK, but in reality is so desperate to cling on to power at any cost that it is prepared to ride roughshod over the very principles of the entire devolution settlement. So if Scotland is not simply to be at the mercy of events, but instead in control of our own future, then the ability to choose a different direction must be available to us. Secondly, presiding officer, there is no doubt that the Scottish Government has a mandate to offer the people of Scotland that choice within this term of Parliament. We have now won, not one, but two elections with that explicit commitment in our manifesto. And the Scottish Parliament has also endorsed that position. By any normal standard of democracy, that mandate is beyond question. Opposition parties, no matter how strongly they disagree with us on independence, as is their right, should therefore stop trying to turn the basic rules of democracy on their head. Signing <laughs> officer, the mandate we have is beyond doubt. But deciding exactly how and when to exercise it is a matter of judgment. And it is a judgment that must be made in the interests of the country as a whole. That is what I have been thinking carefully about. Uh, before, during and since the election campaign, I have had hundreds of conversations with people in every part of Scotland about the issues of Brexit and a second independence referendum. There are, of course, some people who don't want another referendum ever because they oppose 
independence in all circumstances. I, I respect that position. It is entirely honourable and just as legitimate as the position of those who support independence in all circumstances and want another referendum tomorrow. But many people, probably the majority, fall into neither of these categories. Indeed, having spoken to many people who voted yes in 2014 and to many others who did not but who would be open-minded in future, what has struck me is the commonality of their views. They worry about the uncertainty of Brexit and the lack of any clarity whatsoever about what it means. Some of them just want a break from the pressure of making big political decisions. They agree that our future should not be imposed on us but feel that it is just too soon right now to make a firm decision about the precise timing of a referendum. They want greater clarity about Brexit to emerge first and they want to be able to measure that up against clarity about the options Scotland would have for securing a different relationship with Europe. And in the meantime, whatever their scepticism about the likely outcome of the negotiations, they want the Scottish Government to focus as hard as we can on securing the best possible outcome for Scotland. Indeed, that view has even more force now that the general election and the weakness of the UK government has reopened the possibility, however narrow, of averting a hard Brexit and retaining membership of the single market. I have a duty to listen to those views and I intend to do so. The Scottish Government remains committed strongly to the principle of giving Scotland a choice at the end of this process. But I want to reassure people that our proposal is not for a referendum now or before there is sufficient clarity about the options, but rather to give them a choice at the end of the Brexit process when that clarity has emerged. I am therefore confirming today that having listened and reflected, the Scottish Government will reset the plan I set out on March the 13th. We will not seek to introduce the legislation for an independence referendum immediately. Instead, we will, in good faith, redouble our efforts and put our shoulder to the wheel in seeking to influence the Brexit talks in a way that protects Scotland's interests. We will seek to build maximum support around the proposals set out in the paper that we published in December, Scotland's place in Europe, to keep us in the single market with substantial new powers for this Parliament. We will do everything we can to influence the UK in that direction. And then at the end of this period of negotiation with the EU, likely to be around next autumn, when the terms of Brexit will be clearer, we will come back to Parliament to set out our judgment on the best way forward at that time, including our view on the precise timescale for offering people a choice over the country's future. In setting out this position today, I'm also issuing a challenge to the other parties. The Scottish Government will stand the best chance of positively influencing the Brexit outcome if we are at the table with the full backing of our national parliament arguing for the sensible option of staying in the single market. So join us now with no equivocation. Back the demands for the democratically elected Scottish Government to be at the table able to influence the UK's negotiating strategy and for Scotland and the UK to stay in the European single market. Siding officer, the second conclusion I have reached is this. Over the past few months, the focus on the when and the how of a referendum has perhaps inevitably been at the expense of setting out the many reasons why Scotland should be independent. The fact is we are only talking of another referendum so soon after the last one because of Brexit. And it is certainly the case that independence may well be the only way to protect Scotland from the impact of Brexit. But the case for an independent Scotland is not just about Brexit, it goes far beyond that. Many of us already believe that independence is the right and the best answer to the many complex challenges we face as a country and also the best way to seize and fully realise our many opportunities. But we must persuade the majority in Scotland of that. We have not done that yet, but I have no doubt that we can. So the challenge for all of us who believe that Scotland should be independent is to get on with the hard work of making and winning that case on all of its many merits and in a way that is relevant to the changes, challenges, hopes and opportunities we face now and in the years ahead. 
That is what we will do. Of course, we won't do it on our own because the independence case is bigger than us too. Uh, my party will engage openly and inclusively with and work as part of the wider independence movement. We will seek to support, engage and grow that movement and build the case that having decisions made by us, not for us, offers the best future for our country. We will make and seek to win the case that governing ourselves is the best way to tackle the challenges we face as a country, from building a better balanced and more sustainable economy to growing our population, strengthening our democracy and tackling deep-seated problems of poverty and inequality. Presiding officer, my last point today is this. The SNP government has been in office now for 10 years. Uh, I, I am incredibly proud of our achievements, delivered in the most challenging of circumstances and in the face of unprecedented Westminster cuts. I'm also clear about our priorities as we move forward, not just fighting Scotland's corner in the Brexit talks, but also growing our economy and making sure that the public services we all rely on are there when we need them from cradle to grave. That means continuing to work each and every day to improve education, equip our NHS for the challenges of the future, lift people out of poverty and build a social security system with dignity at its heart. But of course, any government after 10 years needs to take stock and refresh. So over this summer, as we prepare our next programme for government and our budget for the year ahead, that is exactly what we will do. We will set out afresh our vision for the country we lead, together with the creative, imaginative, bold and radical policies that, as far as is possible within the current powers available to us, will help us realise that bold, ambition, vision for Scotland. Presiding officer, we look forward to getting on with the job in the best interests of all the people of Scotland. Thank you. We now have about uh, 30 minutes for questions. Thank you. There's now around 30 minutes for questions. There's a lot of interest. Ruth Davidson, question number one. I think the glum faces protest too much with the extended applause. Uh, presiding officer, since the 2014 referendum, nobody, not me nor anyone in this chamber, has ever called for members of the SNP benches to revoke their belief in independence itself. But the issue that we've had this last year has been with a First Minister who has tried to use the UK's decision to leave the European Union to try and impose another referendum on independence on Scotland at the earliest opportunity. No once in a generation, no Edinburgh agreement of respecting the result, just a single vision drive to the line by Nicola Sturgeon to try and secure her place in history. And as our own MSPs have accepted, that decision cost her 21 seats and the support of half a million Scottish voters in the general election. Presiding officer, yes voters and no voters, most people simply don't want this brought back anytime soon. And none of the questions, none of the questions that are raised by Brexit are answered by ripping Scotland out of our own union of nations, our biggest market and our closest friends. And I'm afraid to say today's statement, I'm afraid to say that that statement will fail to give any assurance to those people that this First Minister is listening to them. And again, she makes virtually no mention of her domestic responsibilities. Instead, she appears to be in denial about her mistakes over this last year, and as a result, is leaking credibility and confidence in her leadership by the hour. Her response actually hasn't been to reflect but to simply lash out at the UK government to every opportunity and to sing the same old songs in the same old tune. So let me ask her this. She claims to be putting the referendum to one side and will not introduce the referendum bill to this parliament immediately. So why doesn't she give the country some certainty and just take it off the table for the rest of this parliament? First Minister. The reason it would be wrong to take to use uh, Ruth Davidson's language, a referendum, a choice over our future off the table for the duration of this parliament is this. The Conservative government at Westminster are taking this entire country down a path that is potentially the most damaging thing that has happened to us for a generation 
or more than that. We don't yet know the destination uh, of that journey, but what we do know is that if the Tories get their way, uh, the outcome of this could be devastating for Scottish jobs, for trade, for living standards, for the opportunities of generations to come. I do not think it is right for Scotland to be left at the mercy of wherever the Tories want to take us, regardless of how damaging that is to our present and to our future. That is why I believe at the end of this process, people should have the ability to have that choice. But equally, I recognise that people do not feel ready right now to say when that choice should happen because of the uncertainty that has been created, not just by Brexit, but by the reckless approach to Brexit that this government is pursuing. So we will take account of that and listen to that. And over the next uh, months, we will do everything in our power with absolute focus to try to get from Brexit an outcome that best protects Scotland's interests. And I repeat again my challenge to the other parties. If you also have Scotland's interests at heart, then get behind this government in seeking to be at the table, influencing these negotiations and getting the best outcome for Scotland. It used to be that Ruth Davidson thought being in the EU was best for Scotland and then she capitulated. It used to be that Ruth Davidson thought being in the single market was best for Scotland and then she capitulated. For once, can Ruth Davidson stand firm and back the Scottish Government in getting the best deal for Scotland? And the difference between this government and the UK government is this. We will continue to make decisions and make judgments uh, that we consider to be in the best interests uh, of the country. And that is in stark contrast to the UK government right now. Having blundered and miscalculated its way into an EU referendum and then into a hard Brexit position and then into a general election. It is now so desperate to cling to power at any cost, regardless of the damage that is going to do to our economy, to the reputation of the country, to the devolution settlement, even to peace in Northern Ireland. It is a shameful approach to governing. And do you know what is even more shameful? That Ruth Davidson is prepared to be a cheerleader for all of that. So Ruth Davidson continue to be a cheerleader for the Conservatives. I and this government will continue to take the decisions we think are in the best interests of Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, the First Minister says she has heard the views of the people, that she's reflected on the result of the general election, and her incredulous conclusion is to double down and continue with her campaign for independence. But the truth is, the threat of an unwanted second independence referendum is dead. And this didn't happen because Nicola Sturgeon wanted it to. The people of Scotland have taken that decision for her. But the First Minister is digging her heels in, putting her fingers in her ears and pressing on regardless. She is just not listening. First Minister, why don't you understand? The people of Scotland sent you a clear message at the general election. Get back to governing. When will you listen and get on with the job that really matters? Improving our schools, growing our economy and fixing our NHS. First Minister. Well, it's clear. It's clear that Kezia Dugdale scripted that question before she actually saw or listened to the statement that I have just made. We will not proceed with legislation for an independence referendum immediately. Instead, we will do everything in our power to get the best possible outcome from Brexit. We will do everything in our power to protect Scotland's interests. And then at the end of that process, we will judge the best way forward to make sure that Scotland is not at the mercy of the outcome of that process, regardless of how damaging it's going to be. And the difference between my position and Kezia Dugdale's position is quite simple. I want Scotland to be in control of our own future. I do not want us simply to have to accept any decision imposed on us by a Tory government at Westminster, regardless of the damage that does. I want us to be in control of our own future as a country. Labour simply having advised many people in Scotland to vote for the Conservatives want to leave the future of our country entirely at the mercy of the Conservatives. That's the difference between us and that will continue to be the difference between our two parties.
Mr Carvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland has not consented to being taken out of the European Union against our will. Scotland has not consented to the social and economic wreckage which we know will result if that is what happens. If the First Minister does not introduce a referendum bill until after autumn next year, how long will it be after we've been dragged out of Europe without having consented to it before the people of Scotland are even entitled to make their choice? And why, after a negotiation between a UK government and EU institutions and decisions made by every other member state in Europe, why should the people of Scotland be the only people without the right to make a decision on that timescale? First Minister. Well, I believe Scotland should have a choice at the end of this process, but I recognise that the uncertainty around this process, which is not of our making or our doing, it's entirely down to the incompetent, reckless approach being taken by the UK government. But that uncertainty makes it difficult for those, even those who do want to have a choice at the end of this process, to see right now how we can set a firm timescale for that. And I recognise that, which is why I have said today we are resetting the plan that I outlined on March the 13th. We will not introduce that legislation right now. We will put our shoulder to the wheel of seeking to get the best deal for Scotland, and then we will make a judgment on the right time for a choice uh, when we have that greater clarity, which on the timescale that uh, is being followed right now, I would estimate would be around the autumn of next year. I think that is the sensible and responsible way forward, because what that does is two things. Firstly, it recognises the desire of people not to be rushed, not to have to make a choice before they have the clarity and the information to make an informed choice, something that I never wanted people to have to do, but I'm making that absolutely clear today. But secondly, it does something else. It makes sure that we have the ability to protect our interests at the end of this process. I appreciate that for many people, the real implications and impact of Brexit haven't started to be felt. I suspect that is about to start to change and to change very quickly. But as First Minister, I cannot look anybody across this country in the eye and pretend to them that I do not have profound concerns about the impact of what is about to happen on people in Scotland, not just now, but for many, many years to come. Now, to choose that would be one thing. But to have that imposed upon us, uh, firstly through the EU referendum and then having no choice at the end of the process, would be deeply and profoundly wrong. So what I am doing today is balancing those interests, recognising that people do not want to be rushed, that it is not simply for me to decide the future of this country, but making sure that it is equally not for a Conservative government at Westminster to decide the future of this country, regardless what anybody across Scotland might want. Willie Rennie. Uh, so the First Minister has had a long, hard think about it. And the First Minister has concluded that the First Minister should call another independence referendum at a time of the First Minister's choosing. So absolutely nothing has changed. If she wants to prove she has listened, the First Minister should trigger a vote in this chamber which would rule out another independence referendum in this parliamentary term. Will she agree to that? First Minister. Finished. Well, I have to say, since Willie Rennie didn't seem to give any respect to when the Scottish Parliament did vote on this matter, then why would we expect him to respect the vote of the Scottish Parliament in future? It seems Willie Rennie wants to pick and choose when he respects the will of this Parliament. But on, on the issue of a referendum, Willie Rennie's position, you know, at least I don't, I don't agree with the positions of the Conservatives or Labour. They want to leave this country at the mercy of whatever happens in Brexit, regardless of how damaging it is. But at least their positions have a degree of consistency and logic to them. There is no consistency and no logic whatsoever on the position of the Liberal Democrats on this issue. They don't want to give people in Scotland a choice in another referendum, but they want to have a second referendum on the issue of EU membership. Willie Rennie's position is ridiculous, which is why so few people across this country take him or the Liberal Democrats seriously. Thank you. All the leaders had preambles before the questions. I would appreciate it if all members could get straight to the question. We'll have straight questions and answers. Ben McPherson to be followed by Jackson Carlow. Ben McPherson. 
I am obligated to remind the Chamber that I am a parliamentary liaison officer to the First Minister. Presiding officer, as this, uh, as has just been stated, this Parliament democratically voted to seek a Section 30 order from the UK Government to enable a referendum to take place. Therefore, does the First Minister agree with me that the principle clearly remains that Scotland's future should be for the people of Scotland and this Parliament to decide, and that the Section 30 request should remain on the table? First Minister. Well, I do think this is an important matter of principle that should unite people, whether they support an independence referendum or oppose it, whether they support independence or oppose independence. Surely the decision on if and when there should be an independence referendum should lie with this parliament. And anybody who says otherwise, uh, I think, is subverting an important principle of democracy and the principle of the sovereignty of the Scottish people and the sovereignty of the Scottish Parliament that has long been accepted. Now, on the issue of a, a Section 30 order, clearly I am uh, saying today that we are not immediately introducing uh, an independence bill to this Parliament and therefore the urgency of agreeing uh, that Section 30 order is not what it was uh, previously. But I do think, as a matter of principle, that power to decide the question of if and when there should be an independence referendum should be transferred from Westminster to the Scottish Parliament and everybody who cares about the rights of this Parliament to take these decisions should back that. Jackson Carlow to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Does the First Minister not acknowledge that on June the 8th her party lost half a million votes, one third of its total support, and achieved the lowest share of the vote for a leading party in Scotland since 1955? And yet she has announced no change. Is it not now clear that the only refresh Scotland needs, the only way to move beyond constitutional turmoil, is for an outraged Scotland to be done with this First Minister and done with this failing Scottish Government? First Minister. Well, you know, whatever Jackson Carlaw might say about the election result on June the 8th, one thing is beyond any doubt. The SNP won that election and handsomely beat the Conservatives, Labour and the Liberal. Democrats. But you know what? We should take no lectures right now from a Conservative government that is reduced to bribing the DUP to keep its hands on power. That's what the Tories are reduced to. Uh, completely riding roughshod over the principles of the devolution settlement in order to cling on to power in a tawdry, shoddy deal with the DUP. That should shame the Conservatives. It's not so long ago, June the 9th in fact, June the 9th, that Ruth Davidson's spokesperson was briefing that she was more powerful than the DUP <laughs> in number 10 Downing Street. How is it then, presiding officer, that the DUP came away with a billion pounds for Northern Ireland and the Scottish Tories came away with zero for Scotland. That says it all about the Scottish Conservatives. Christina McKelvey to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Yesterday's grubby cash for votes deal between the Tories and that DUP threw into sharp relief the democratic deficit that Scotland faces while our key decisions over our future are at stake. A government we didn't vote for, propped up by a party we have no choice in ever voting for. Does that not underline, presiding officer, the case for Scotland, yes, Scotland, to be given a choice over our future at the appropriate time? First Minister. Well, as I've said today, we will not uh, proceed right now with a referendum bill. Uh, I think that is uh, an important change that I am confirming and making clear today. But, you know, people can see what's happening uh, at Westminster and the implications that has for people across Scotland. Uh, before the election, we knew we were faced with Brexit. We knew we were faced with the likelihood of a hard Brexit, taking Scotland out of the single market <laughs> with the potential loss of 80,000 jobs, a hit to our revenues and our GDP for many years to come. But now, of course, we're faced with a UK government that, as we saw yesterday, is completely dependent uh, for staying in power on the DUP. And we've seen the lengths they are prepared to go to in order to cling on to power at any cost. And I really do think it is of deep and profound concern that we have a Conservative government at Westminster that blundered into an EU referendum, 
blundered into the hard Brexit position, blundered into a general election and has now left the country in hawk to the DUP. And they are so desperate to cling to power that they are prepared to sacrifice uh, almost anything. The economy, the reputation of the UK internationally and even the peace process in Northern Ireland. Now, I think that is shameful and I do think it is uh, underlining the need for this country not to be at the mercy of whatever a Conservative government decides to do but to be in control <laughs> of our own future at the right time. That is the position of this government and I believe it is the right and proper one. Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Alec Neil. Lewis MacDonald. The First Minister appears still not to understand that confusing the issue of Britain leaving the European Union and Scotland leaving the United Kingdom is a profoundly unwise course to follow. Perhaps she does so because she believes she won the election a few weeks ago. But if she really believes that the best chance of positively influencing the Brexit outcome is by the Scottish Government being at the table as part of the UK's negotiating team, and she wants other parties to back her case for that, will she now not accept that the way to build a case for joining in a common approach is not to start by saying that the first thing you will do afterwards is to walk away from that common approach altogether. Yeah. First Minister. Well, I'm not entirely sure uh, where Lewis MacDonald is coming from in this. I want to build a consensus that says we stay in the single market. It used to be that other parties in this chamber backed that position. Uh, and I believe we have an opportunity now uh, to unite this parliament and to unite a majority across the country uh, behind that option of staying in the single market, accepting, however reluctantly, that the UK is coming out of the EU, but <laughs> refusing to accept that that has to be at uh, the expense of jobs and trade and investment by taking ourselves out of the single market. So I will give uh, people across this chamber the opportunity to decide whether they want to back uh, the Scottish Government in that. We have uh, a period now between now and no doubt next autumn when these negotiations are going to continue and shape the future relationship of this country with the European Union. So are we prepared as a parliament to put our shoulder to the wheel to try to make sure that Scotland gets the best possible outcome of that? That's what I'm going to do. That's what this government is going to do. It remains to be seen uh, whether the other parties in this chamber have the ability to rise above uh, their hostility to the SNP and for once put Scotland's interests centre stage. Alec Neill to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Presenting officer, can I welcome the First Minister's statement. The key issue here is the outcome of the Brexit negotiations. Does the First Minister agree with me that the three key demands from Scotland now must be, number one, a successor trade agreement that's right for Scottish jobs and industry, including access to the single market. Number two, that the powers in Brussels coming back to the UK in relation to Scotland come to this parliament and don't get stuck in London. And number three, that the £1.6 billion a year, which is Scotland's share of the EU contribution, comes along with those powers back from Brussels to this parliament. And does the First Minister agree with me that if yet again a UK government doesn't deliver for Scotland, the case for an independent Scotland will be unanswerable? First Minister. Well, I think Alec Neil does outline the three broad areas where over the next uh, year to 18 months, the UK government has got a chance to prove that it is able to act in Scotland's best interest. Uh, yes, making sure that our businesses are not ripped out of the single market. I happen to believe strongly that the best trading arrangement for the future of Scotland uh, when the UK leaves <coughs> the EU, as long as we are part of the e uh, UK, is to be in the single market. And that is why we will do everything in our powers to secure that. Secondly, uh, not only should we see powers that are repatriated from uh, Brussels come unequivocally to Scotland where they are within devolved responsibilities and not be centralised in a power grab at Westminster. This is also an opportunity for us to argue for and win new powers for this parliament. No longer is it acceptable, and this is not just Scotland's view, for powers like immigration, for example, to be centralised at Westminster, because the Westminster approach to issues like this are damaging the interests of our economy. And thirdly, yes, that we get commitments 
uh, in terms of the funding to make sure that Brexit is not used as a cover uh, to take funding away from our farmers, our fishermen and our economy generally. So these are very much three areas where we have an opportunity now to make sure that we get the best outcome for Scotland. And those who do not want to see Scotland choose independence in future have an opportunity to prove that they can deliver. So let's see over these next few months uh, whether we see Scotland's interests protected by the UK government and by the other parties represented in this chamber or not. And then people in Scotland can make a choice about what their best future might be. Adam Tompkins to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In March, the, uh, in, in March, Scott Sen reported that support for Scotland taking a different path in the wake of Brexit is much lower than anticipated. Any second attempt to seek independence because of Brexit, they said, is unlikely to prove particularly persuasive. We knew that at the beginning of March, Presiding Officer. So why has the First Minister taken four months to admit it? First Minister. Well, he should get his stories straight with his leaders. She says, I'm not changing anything, and he says the complete opposite. But do you know what? This may be, this may be quite hard for the Conservatives to grasp. But uh, looking at their uh, performance just now, I understand that this is very grasp, uh, hard for the Conservatives to grasp. But I seek to make judgments on what I consider to be in the best interests uh, of the country. I accept not everybody agrees with those judgments, and that I understand. But I seek to be guided, as I have been since June last year, the day after the referendum, on what is in the best interests of the country. Uh, that's what I uh, continue to seek to do. Uh, but my last point to Adam Tompkins uh, is this, and to the Conservatives, if they are so sure, so certain, that people in Scotland don't want independence. Why are they so scared of ever putting it to the test? Bruce Crawford to be followed by Neil Findlay. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. In the light of the complete disarray at Westminster, has the UK government given any indication that it will revisit the timescales as to when the terms of the Brexit deal will be clear, because they should, and have they communicated that to the governments of Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland? First Minister. Well, it's a good question. And, you know, in, in reality, it remains the case, and I very much hope this will change, and everybody across this Parliament should hope this changes. But until now, there has been very little meaningful uh, communication between the UK government and the Scottish government about this Brexit process. Now, I hope that changes, and I hope it changes in a substantial way. Uh, and, you know, I know. People in other parties in this chamber uh, find it difficult, even when they think we're right, to actually agree with the SNP. But on these matters, it's not just the SNP or the Scottish Government making this case, it's Karen Jones, uh, the Welsh First Minister, making the case that the devolved administrations have to be much more centrally and meaningfully engaged. So I hope we see a much different approach. If we see a different approach from the UK Government, then this Government will respond constructively to that. On the question of the timescales, uh, we have to work on the basis <coughs> of what is being said publicly. Uh, we know that the UK intends to leave the EU in March uh, 2019. We know that a deal, therefore, has to be uh, reached in order to go for ratification in other European countries somewhere uh, around six months before that, which is around the autumn uh, of next year. So that is when I would expect that the terms of the future relationship with the EU start to become a lot clearer than they are now. But of course, uh, I am not in control of those timescales. Uh, not even the UK government is entirely in control of those timescales. But that underlines the importance of having as much dialogue uh, and communication between the different governments of the UK so that we can influence these issues as much as possible. I'll allow another five minutes, but uh, if we can be quick with all the questions. Neil Findlay to be followed by Marie Todd. Uh, the First Minister has taken a position on two referendums and been on the losing side in both. Isn't it a bit rich for her to lecture anyone about democracy when she routinely ignores the will of this Parliament on fracking, on NHS closures, on council budgets, on Highland and Islands Enterprise and on the Food Football Act and ploughs on regardless? We can have a choice after Brexit. It's called a general election, where we can elect Jeremy Corbyn to lead a Labour government and change this country. That day can't come soon enough for me. First Minister, do you fancy a general election tomorrow, the next day, next week or next year? Because I do. First Minister. 
Well, if only Neil Finlay could have seen the face of a Scottish Party leader at that point, he would have been, uh, no doubt, bemused. Can I just say to, to Neil Finlay, uh, just, just, a, just a bit of, well, firstly a reminder, and also maybe just a little bit of explanation of, of democracy here. I argued for Remain in the EU referendum last year. 62% of people in Scotland voted to remain. I call that being on the winning side of the EU referendum in Scotland. The problem, the problem we have in Scotland, which Neil Finlay appears quite happy with, inexplicably to me, is that he thinks Scotland's voice should count for nothing in that and we should simply uh, be told what to do uh, by majority opinion across the whole of the UK. And in terms of his second point uh, about uh, a future uh, Labour uh, government, well, as far as I can tell right now, and again, I hope this is something that changes, uh, just like Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn also wants us to leave the single market, putting tens of thousands of Scottish jobs on the line. So I know there are more sensible heads in the Labour Party and my colleagues in the House of Commons will seek to work with them to get to a position where we have as much support as possible for keeping Scotland and the UK in the single market because that's what makes more sense for jobs and for our economy. Marie Todd to be followed by Murda Fraser. Does the First Minister agree with me that when assessing the position Scotland finds itself in, the balance of power between the Scottish and UK government is an important factor? Would she also agree that any move to re-reserve powers would further undermine the principles of devolution? First Minister. Well, I do think it is important in principle, but also important for practical reasons, that there is no power grab on powers that lie within devolved areas. So if powers are to be repatriated uh, from Brussels, then if they lie within devolved areas, they must come to this parliament. And again, that is not just uh, a view I hold, it is a view held uh, by the First Minister of Wales as well. And that will be something we are looking very, very closely at when we eventually see the terms of the repeal bill, which of course we haven't seen in any uh, detail yet. Of course, it was confirmed uh, yesterday that the repeal bill will require the legislative consent of this parliament and the other uh, devolved parliaments across the UK. So that means that this entire parliament, not just this government, has both a responsibility and an opportunity to scrutinise that very closely in deciding whether or not to give its legislative consent to that bill. Murder Fraser to be followed by Gail Ross. Uh, thank you. Uh, the First Minister is fond of referring to the 62% of Scots who voted Remain in last year's EU referendum as an overwhelming majority. How would you describe the 63% of Scots who voted in this month's general election for parties who stood on a platform opposed to a second independence referendum? Yeah. First Minister. Well, it may be a useful opportunity, certainly one I'm going to take, of uh, A, reminding people that the SNP won the election, and also reminding people, as Murdo Fraser has just done, of the unholy alliance between Labour uh, and the Conservatives, uh, and indeed the Liberal Democrats, in this election. Uh, at least one Liberal Democrat is proud of his unholy alliance with the Conservatives, which is always uh, good to see. But, you know, we... Uh, have a tradition, not just in Scotland but in the UK, of deciding constitutional matters uh, by referendum. That is the right uh, thing to do. And of course it was the Conservatives in the last independence referendum that told the people of Scotland, in fact Ruth Davidson said it to them directly in uh, at least one uh, television appearance, that the only way to protect our place in the European Union was to vote against Scottish independence. I'm not sure how that's working out for her. But as I've said today, we will continue to act in the best interests of the country as a whole, making sure that we do everything we can to get the best outcome uh, for Scotland from the Brexit talks, not introducing independence referendum legislation while we are doing that, but also making sure that Scotland is not in a position of having no control over our own future, regardless of the outcome of these talks. That is the right and the responsible position to have, and it would be the right and responsible position for anybody with Scotland's best interests at heart. And finally, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. No doubt the Chamber will be delighted to be reminded that I am also a PLO to the First Minister. <laughs> Isn't it the case that from the moment the Scottish Government set out its plans in terms of legislating for another referendum, it was clear that this was a means to ensure Scotland's interests were protected through the Brexit process? 
How much more can the Scottish Government impress upon the UK Government that we cannot and we will not sit idly by as jobs, incomes and our economy are willfully damaged by Tory policies? First Minister. Well, I think it's, it's a good reminder that for all the political toing and froing we have in this chamber, which we all partake in, what we're talking about here are jobs and the future of our economy, uh, investment, trade, uh, the ability of our companies to export freely. And if also what we're talking about here are the opportunities, not just for this generation, but for generations to come to travel uh, freely across Europe. These are things that really matter. And it is not an exaggeration to say that all of them, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, are on the line right now uh, as these negotiations continue. And I think it is absolutely essential that we do everything we can to protect all of these things. That's what this government intends to do. And it's also essential that we make sure that whatever happens, the future of Scotland is always decided by Scotland. Whatever we choose is up to the people of Scotland, but it should be choos chosen for us, not imposed by us. And that's the principle that will continue to govern the decisions we take. Thank you very much. That concludes our statement on European negotiations and Scotland's future. We'll now move to a statement by Shona Robson, Cabinet Secretary for Health. We'll just take a few moments for members to change their seats.